Let's turn now to the socio-psychological area of research and look at some theories within it. Relational schemas in families is a fascinating area for me because I can see myself in it and you probably will be able to see yourself in it. And so a schema is a mental framework or a patterned way of thinking or interpreting and viewing something. A schema is a mental map, if you will. It's like a, uh, a filter that we understand things through. And your family, you have a mental schema for your family that helps you understand and make sense of what it means to be a family and how you should act within a family and so forth. And so your family schema determines, and that's a pretty strong word there. It's not like it forces you, but it's a main, main shaping uh, element. It determines the way you interact with members of your family and with others. So for example, you have three overlapping schemas and at the first most specific level you have a schema for how you're going to interact with each specific person in your family relationships. So if you have a brother, you have a history with that person and, and through that history interacting with your brother, you have a mental, you have a mindset, a, a way of viewing that relationship that shapes the way you're going to interact with that person. So if you normally do, uh, you know, talk about and read comic books together, then when you hang out and speak to them, you're going to do that. You're going to fall into that topic and you're going to have those conversations. And uh, that schema is specific to that relationship. So you're not necessarily going to do the same thing with another sibling. Maybe your sister, you and your sister do not have a common bond about comic books and you talk about different kinds of things and you interact in different kinds of ways. And you know that because your relationships with each of your siblings is a little bit different. Uh, my, my wife is a great example. She has a relationship with her, she's the youngest of three girls in her family, and she is the, she's the youngest, so she has a relationship with the sister that's one notch ab above her in the birth order, and she has a relationship that's two notches above her, uh, her the sister in, in, in that family, right? So, and by the way, a lot of times when kids are in close, um, close birth order, so the, you know the second and third child, they might have a fairly competitive relationship. It's possible because they might compete over resources. They want to play with the same toys. They want to do the same kinds of things, and and so they have to learn to share. Sometimes when siblings are separated by a few more years, like my my wife and her oldest sister, there's not that competitive element, and so uh, the older sibling might take the younger one along as kind of their little sidekick and that's the kind of relationship that uh, my wife had with her oldest sister her oldest sister would somehow sometimes bring her along to hang out with some of the older friends and it was just like this cute little sidekick and so they have different relationships you interact with your mom a little differently than you do with your dad specific relationships and everybody in the family has a schema for each specific relationship that schema becomes your guide you don't even necessarily think of it, but it becomes your guide for how you interact with them in the future. Sometimes you actually can feel the restraints of that. You think, oh, every time I talk to my mom, I talk about the same things. We're like in a groove. We're in a rut. Every time I talk to my brother, it's always the same. Nothing's really changing. It might provide some guidance and comfort, but it also might feel constraining. Then you have a schema for your family in general. Like, we're a family that likes to have fun. We're a family that has a lot of conflict. You know, you have a certain view of what it means to be in your family and that guides how you're going to interact with your family. And so that's another layer. And then the most general layer of all is where you have a view of what families are supposed to be like in the general sense, not specific to your family, but just families. So you start hanging out with kids from other families in the neighborhood and you visit, maybe sleep over their house when you're young, and you realize, oh, I didn't realize that our family was different. You start to see how your family is unique, and maybe uh, you feel like, wow, my family's weird. I guess this other family is normal, or maybe it's the reverse. Wow, this family's really weird. They're not like us. So we watch these on TV, and we um, see this at other people's houses, and people just talk about what it means to be a family, you might hear a pastor talk about it at church on a Sunday morning and you think, oh, that's what a family is supposed to be. And in the absence of the first two, 
specific relationship or schema for your family, you will fall back on a general sense for what a family is supposed to look like. Which is why, by the way, uh, even no matter how weird your family is, if you go out in public, you're likely to try to uphold the schema for what families are supposed to act like in general. You try to pretend, quote, that you're a normal family. And uh, almost all of the people I talk to um, sense that, oh yeah, when you're out and in public, you're supposed to act normal. You keep your weirdness in private. Uh, but the truth is, everybody has weirdness. Everybody, fa Every family has their own specific types of in ways of interacting. We're human beings. We're all completely really unique in a way at some level. And so these are the different ways to understand schemas. We're going to look now at four different schemas of the family. There are four primary schemas when we look at family uh, relationships and the first two are generally considered to be ones that work out pretty well for families. The first is a consensual family schema. This schema involves high communication sometimes called high conversation, and high conformity. And they display traditional marriage relationships. So high communication or high conversation means that these families talk a lot with each other. And they don't just talk about sports and politics and weather. They go into personal topics. And so <clears throat> lots of conversation about relationships, about what people are going through, how was your day, um, if you're on a car ride, it's not silent. People are talking the whole time. If you're a 10 out of 10 on the communication scale in your family, then you're talking the whole time in the car ride. Um, when you're at dinner, it's you know it might take you a couple of hours to get through a family dinner because everybody's interacting and talking and laughing and telling stories. Uh, even debate, however, even argument is considered a form of high communication. They say having an argument, as long as it doesn't get aggressive, having a, a little bit of a conflict, is actually good for families because they're communicating, they're talking to each other about things. So anytime you see these people get together, they are communicating. And this is like the family that I grew up in. Um, I just had my family visit, my mom and dad visit, and uh, they came to stay with us over the holidays, and we had a really great time. And we just talked the whole time. My mother's working on a screenplay, we're talking about that, and and she's bouncing ideas off me and I'm listening and even though I don't know anything about writing a screenplay, I'm sharing my thoughts. My dad and I are talking about um, about religion and not just, you know, critiquing the world religions, but we're talking personal stuff about our own faith journeys, for example. I mean, that's personal, right? That's not just talking about the weather. High communication, high communication, high conversation, always talking, talking. It doesn't mean there's no pauses in the conversation, but if you're a 10 out of 10 in your family, you're talking a lot. Then there's high conformity, the second variable. Let's imagine another scale, 0 to 10. High conformity means that you are fulfilling traditional kinds of roles for the culture that you're in. In this case, I grew up in the United States, and and I um, and usually in, in the United States, for example, the mom and dad, this is traditional, again, traditional marriage type. Mom and dad are a team. They're a unit and they are separate from the kids. So the parents make the decisions. They might listen to what their kids think because it's high communication, lots of conversation. But in the end, the mom and dad are probably going to uh, go in a separate room at some point or put the kids to bed and then have a conversation and then make a decision about what should happen. Let's say you're going to go on vacation. And a couple of the kids want to go to Disney World and, uh, you know, someone else wants to go to the beach. And, and, and everybody's talking about it at dinner, high communication, put the kids to bed, high conformity. The parents say, okay, well, what do you think we should do? We have enough money to go on a little bit of a vacation here. What should we do? The parents decide. And then the next morning, for example, they say, okay, kids, mom and dad talked and here's what we're going to do. And the kids may or may not complain, but they're basically going to accept that mom and dad are a team. They're in charge. And if dad says something, it's the same as when mom says it and, and vice versa. So there's really that one voice that comes out of that traditional uh, marriage type. And traditional marriage type is where uh, you have the husband and the wife. And uh, even though both people may work in this relationship, you would see that the husband is probably considered to be the main breadwinner. That means that even if 
<clears throat> even if the mom has a job, uh, let's say there's, uh, you know, the family starts having kids, it's much more likely that the dad is going to continue to work and maybe the mom stay at home for a little while. That's traditional marriage type. And that's a very cultural, um, a cultural thing. It's different throughout the world. I'm just talking about the United States marriages here and that traditional marriage type. And uh, that's really the, the, the same for the kids as well. The kids are going to play roles in the family and they're going to uh, follow, though, the parents. So that's consensual. When I grew up, uh, high communication was part of my family upbringing, but high conformity was not. My uh, family of origin is a low conformity family. And in fact, when I grew up, uh, the word conformity was a dirty word. I mean, you you know, that was like people said it with a little tone in their voice, like, ah, oh, you're just conforming. Um, so I did not grow up in a consensual family. I grew up in a pluralistic family where we had high communication. Again, all of those same things, lots of conversation, but we had low conformity. So my mom and dad did not display the typical or traditional marriage type. My dad was a musician. He mostly rehearsed and played um, shows at night. My mother worked during the day, first as a secretary, then as a teacher. And the kids, the four, the three boys, I mean, um, we, yeah, we grew our hair long and we were in bands and we did all kinds of things and we were coming and going. And if my mom said something, I did not at all consider that it was the same as my dad. They were obviously married and they still are married, but they were pretty independent from each other. They both had separate careers and even separate ideas of what a family should look like. My father was uh, kind of a wild man and, and uh, you know, as long as the kids are playing outside and, and swinging from ropes and climbing all over, everything was probably okay. And my mother was a little bit more like wondering, you know, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to these kids? Are they going to break their necks and, and um, they're so they're so wild and so they they had a lot of friction over those things and uh, a lot of friction over career choices and and uh, at many points because my dad was a musician my mom was the breadwinner and um, the old starving musician thing was true for quite a while and my parents became a little bit more traditional as they got older but um, they did not conform to the norms of society. In fact, in fact, my teachers would often say to my parents when they would see them when we were in uh, middle school and high school, they would say to my parents, they might bump into them at the store and they said, what is going on with your kids? You've got to get a, a handle on this. And and my parents were kind of hippies. Hey, they'll be all right, you know, and it was very, uh, very independent relationships within the family. Even though we have a bond, high communication, we were low in the conformity. So you'll notice the things that these two have in common are high communication. And so uh, these are the two most satisfying types of marriages. If you're going to have a great marriage, you have to have high communication. If you're going to have a satisfying family um, and family relationships, you have to have high communication. That's what the research shows. These families tend to stay together. They tend to enjoy each other and feel good about their family relationships. And the thing they have in common is high communication. Conformity actually does help a little bit. The consensual families and traditional marriage types tend to last and they tend to be happier. That, that's what the research shows. Um, so there might be a value to conformity, but conformity alone without communication is not a great recipe and leads to a lot of problems. So let's turn now to the next two schemas. So the third and fourth schemas are protective and laissez-faire. The protective schema is low communication. People are not talking with each other. If they are, it's about the weather, it's about those surface level things, about how the bills still stink or whatever. And those things are not unimportant. Um, they're fine. But if that's as deep as the conversation goes, then they're probably not really communicating about those personal things that will bind you together. Oftentimes car rides are silent. Dinner time might be fairly quiet with people making some polite chit chat, but again, nothing of substance. 
and uh, low communication. So they're not really talking about matters of the heart. They're not really using communication as a way to help the uh, family relationships grow and thrive. I was once, when I was a kid, at somebody's house and they asked me over for dinner and nobody talked. And because my family is a high communication family, I noticed this. And so I talked a little bit <clears throat> at the dinner because I was used to doing that. And then I noticed that no one else was really talking. They were politely responding to me, uh, but that was about it. And so I thought, oh, I'm, you know, I'll be quiet. So <laughs> I, I quieted down and then I noticed that there would be minutes and minutes straight where nobody would say anything. And I, I thought at first like, wow, like somebody's in a really bad mood here. Like, oh, maybe I said something wrong or maybe somebody's upset. Because sometimes, you know, when we're upset, we don't want to talk. Um, it turns out that everything was normal. In that family, they were low, they were protective, low communication. They did not speak. So there's a little bit of protective meaning that they don't talk, so they're protective of what they feel and what they think. They don't want to, re you know, reveal anything. Uh, but high conformity. This family looked very normal, quote, normal. They were fulfilling those societal expectations about what makes a, a family look normal. They had all the normal traditional roles where the mom and dad looked the part, the kids followed the orders, but there wasn't a lot of communication backward and forward. Uh, this marriage type is generally described as separate, a separate marriage type. It's in quotes, they're not living separately in a literal sense, but in other words, it's sort of like they're roommates. They live under the same roof and they share the bills, but they don't have that deeper conversational time where they're sharing all their matters of the heart and certainly not um, as an entire family. So I, I know some families I grew up with that were like this. They just didn't really talk to each other. And if something was wrong, they, they might not talk for days and days. And that wouldn't signal that there was a really big problem that would just be the normal way they handled things. So uh, protective families tend to have lower levels of satisfaction and they're more likely in the long run to lead toward divorce. They do not, it doesn't mean that you'll get divorced, but when they looked at the longitudinal data on marriage types, at first they thought, when they were just looking at the short-term data, oh, this is just another marriage type and it's totally normal and fine. Well, it might be normal, but it probably isn't fine because when they looked at the, the data over the long run, they kept keeping track of these couples. They noticed that the people that had separate marriage types and their protective or low communication families tended to be less satisfied and lead toward divorce at much higher rates. So um, again, low communication seems to be the culprit there. You can have a high, commu a high conformity family and it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to answer the questions or, or solve the riddle as far as how, how to be a happy family. It's really high communication that makes the difference. So you can say, look, why am I a communication major? People say, why are you a communication major? And you'll say, look, communication is like the main thing that makes families happy and it makes them last. So if I get nothing else out of this course or you know out of this major, I'm, I'm more equipped to have a happier marriage, a happier family. And I mean, that's that's pretty good, right? If you're looking at, again, this big pot of money, this bag of money, but you don't have great relationships, and then, or compared to happy relationships, on the other hand, it seems like communication seems to be um, a, a, an almost surefire way to make things better. Even if you have to argue, it's better to say the things than to, left the, to leave them unsaid the way they would in a protective family. And the fourth, the laissez-faire category, it's a schema that is hardly even applicable to most families. They both have low communication and low conformity. There's almost nothing holding these families together, perhaps except their last name. And they display uh, dysfunctional types of, of marriage. <clears throat> Oftentimes it's separate type of marriage or one person wants one thing and the other wants the other things. Um, it's, it's very unlikely that these families are going to last. It, you might even question how they became families in the first place. Uh, so I'll mention a couple things here as, as we close down this little 
part of um, the lecture on this chapter. These schemas are very powerful. If you came from a consensual family, you are highly likely to desire and seek out, even if you don't realize it, a consensual relationship and family type and a traditional marriage because that's the way you grew up. That feels familiar to you. It makes sense. So you meet someone and they seem to fit you like a puzzle piece fits you. You, you hang out with them and you talk to them and you're not exactly sure why, but you just click because you look at them and you go, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, same thing with a pluralistic, same thing with all these schemas, but you meet someone and it's familiar to you because you grew up that way. And so without even trying to look for it, you often will find it because it's like somebody knows the same combination to the safe that you know. They, they understand that there's a compatibility there. You might not like the same music. You might not um, like the same movies. But look, there's this compatibility in the way you interact. There's a schema there that's unspoken that helps guide you and, and, um, and then you find the other person. Now, the upside of this is if you come from a consensual or pluralistic family, you can probably find someone like that, hopefully. The other downside though is if you come from a protective or laissez-faire type and you don't want to have that. In other words, a lot of people that I've spoken to think, I, you know, I want to do, my parents did some okay things, but I want to do better. I want to have a better marriage than that. I want to raise my kids in a better way than that, be a more effective parent. The trouble is, is that these schemas are so powerful that you really have to make a conscious effort to develop that high communication in your relationship. And if you're wondering, geez, you know, I don't know if I have high communication or not. I don't know. You probably don't. In other words, people that have high communication can, exp yeah, they'll, they'll say, absolutely, we talk there. We love talking. We love hanging out. People that have low communication usually wonder, like, do we talk at dinner? Geez, I don't know. Because it feels so normal to not talk at dinner or to not talk on car rides or to not have conversations about personal things. You might not even notice it. So you really have to fight against the grain. If you're going to have a high communication family, you, you might have to compensate and go against the grain. Very often, uh, we have seen that people will end up picking somebody that's just, let's say uh, I'm a guy, right? So I might end up looking and noticing someone who fits me the same way that my mom fit my dad or my dad fit my mom. I might look for that. So much so that let's say um, a, a girl grew up in a house where the mom was was uh, an enabler for an alcoholic father. Well, when that little girl sees that, it looks normal. That becomes a schema for what a family looks like. And then she grows up and wouldn't you know it, she ends up marrying somebody who has a drinking problem and that she enables. It's, it's not because she, quote, wants that. It's because it's familiar. She knows how to fit into that because she's grown up on it. She's seen it a million times. She knows how to play that role. So these schemas don't force us into a certain family schema or a marriage type. They don't force us to be, to conform or, to, or not to conform or to communicate high or low, but they are a very strong guide. And if you want to break out of your schema and and try to have a truly healthy family relationship situation, then you have to be aware of it and you have to work, consistently work toward it. The next theory we look at is social penetration theory. And this theory explains a lot about how we make friends, how we keep friends, and how we make decisions about those friends. And most of this escapes our normal level of awareness, but uh, we do things this way. So this is also called the onion theory because the onion has layers and in the layers there's little segments that you can see within each layer that's divided. And in the same way, this social penetration theory says that we are really, our conversations tap into different layers of who we are. So on the surface, you have those basic level discussions and then you get a little closer to the middle and you have uh, more personal discussions and then as you get toward the core of the onion that's where you get the most personal or the word they use is intimate. And so we have um, this metaphor that is easy to remember social penetration theory. 
So two of the leading concepts in this theory are self-disclosure and reciprocity. We mentioned this theory early on in the semester as an illustration, uh, but we didn't really explain it all. Here we're going to explain it. So self-disclosure is when you reveal things about yourself that the other person might not know otherwise. They can't just tell from looking at you. You have to tell them something about you, something about your past, a little issue, an interest, anything. And reciprocity is what happens when the other person shares something in return. They reciprocate. And you often feel this slight freedom or slight feeling of even obligation to share something. So let's say somebody tells you that they've been struggling with some depression lately. Then they dis uh, somebody discloses that in the conversation. The other person might reciprocate. They might say, well, you know, I, I know what it's like to struggle with that. I, I've been in that situation too. And so you have self-disclosure and then reciprocity, the back and forth mutual sharing. Breath, and that's one way that we get closer to each other. We self-disclose and we reciprocate. And then we feel a connection to that person. We feel bonded because they know something about us. We know something about them and we might even share that thing. Breath and depth are two related concepts. The breath concept refers to the variety of topics that we speak about to that person. We talk about sports, politics, religion, work, family, food, etc. But maybe only at a basic level, that outer layer of the onion. Depth is where we dig down into each area and we learn more and more about a person. So first they tell you a little bit about their family and then over time maybe they tell you a little bit more about their family and they say, oh well here's some things I haven't told you yet. And, and this usually takes time because you don't tell everything to everybody. You, you wait to see how they handle those little bits of information. And if they handle it well, and if it's, you know, maybe you're taking a little risk and they handle it well and they reciprocate, then you say, okay, that person is safe. We understand each other. So then the next time you talk, you might tell them a little bit something more. And that's the breadth and depth dynamic. We don't always know the, the deepest areas in every relationship. You might have just a couple of areas of depth that you have dug into with that other person. Um, in my relationship with my wife, we have complete breadth of topics. We talk about everything under the sun. And over 12, 15 years of our relationship, even when we started dating 15 years, uh, we have dug deep into the different areas. So. Now I think she knows just about everything about me in all those different areas, every opinion, every, every thoughts, every, you know, everything really. And, and same for me uh, in, in terms of understanding her. It, we still are learning a little bit about each other, but they're all pretty, all the things we learn now are usually at those deeper levels. This theory, social penetration theory, was, is born out of, if you will, or came from, social exchange theory. Social exchange theory is a economic metaphor or analogy for understanding how we get into relationships and how we keep relationships or how we make decisions to not be in those relationships. And I use the word relationships to count for just about every type of relationship that is voluntary. So it could be romantic, could be with an older, maybe you're an adult and it's with a parent, so now you're grown and that relationship becomes a little more voluntary. Could be with just a friend, any, any really, any type of relationship could, could go here. And the idea behind this economic metaphor is that there are certain costs and rewards in every relationship. Examples of costs might be the amount of time you spend with a person. And if, because if you're using your time there, then you're not using it somewhere else the amount of emotional energy you put into that relationship, maybe um, that's a cost because let's say someone is, is, has high needs in that area and they're not really giving much back, well that's a cost. Uh, there, there's all kinds of you know drama that some people bring in to the conversation, the relationship, and that can be a cost, etc. And the reward, of course, is depends upon the relationship, but usually we find companionship uh, to be a, a very nice reward, um, commonality with other people, a nice reward, the comfort of having friends that are there to support you, that's a reward. And according to this theory, without realizing it, we often will have a little scale where we'll say, geez, you know, if this relationship costs a lot, but there are very few rewards, well, 
I don't know, maybe I'm not gonna hang out with that person as much because when I do, it's pretty costly, right? There's all, all kinds of drama, etc., high maintenance, but uh, not a lot of rewards. And we tend to want to hang around with our friends our, in, in those relationships where they're more rewarding than costly. So yeah, you're putting in time and energy, but you're also getting a good reward for that. You feel great, you get to hang out, and, and you love being around that person. It's more rewarding. So our relationships have these costs and rewards. There's also what we call a comparison level. In our minds, we have a little bit of a gauge, like a thermostat, where we expect that a relationship should have a certain balance of costs and rewards. We want a little more rewards than we want costs, naturally. We, and each person has a different comfort level with what they're expecting and what they're hoping for out of the balance of costs and rewards. We have in our minds a level that we compare our relationship to. We want a certain amount of payoff, if you will. If, again, if, if we say, hey, a relationship should be a little bit more rewarding than it is costly, and we're hanging out with a person, and for quite a while, they're just all costs and no rewards, right? They're selfish, they're, they're not showing up when they say they're supposed to, they're borrowing money and not giving it back, they're getting into trouble with the police and trying to drag us into it. That's a costly relationship. In our minds, we have a level that we are measuring that against, and we might think, geez, it's just not worth it, right? I mean, relationships should not be this hard. And you might make a decision to spend uh, less time with that person, or maybe your significant other is is doing these things, and you think, "I just don't see us working out. This is uh, this is this is not fun." Uh, that's where you have it in your mind. The comparison level alternative is to where you actually have an alternative person in your life who is more rewarding and less costly than the person you're hanging out with currently. Uh, this could go for like a job. Let's say there's a job offer on the table somewhere else and it's way better. Maybe it pays more, better hours, a nicer culture to work in. You would compare your current job to that other job and if you felt like there was enough difference, you, would, you, would, might, you might go to the different job. In fact, it's one of the key indicators that uh, an employee is going to leave is if they have a clearly better situation, a clearly better alternative somewhere else. <clears throat> so uh, if you're stuck in a miserable relationship, you might not get out because you don't see any alternatives. That's uh, one of the classic uh, problems in difficult relationships is people don't get out because they don't see any other way. And in fact, um, it's one of the reasons why people even stay in abusive relationships because they think, well, something is better than nothing. And it becomes a very twisted way to uh, justify staying in that dysfunctional relationship, but you do see it. Uh, by the way, I want to mention the idea of marriage uh, for a minute and the idea of loyalty to one's family members. This, this notion of social exchange or costs and rewards is, was never put forward by the researchers as a way that you should go around and evaluate every one of your relationships. They're not saying, hey, go out there, do some calculations and dump the people that are too costly and only keep the people that are rewarding. They don't uh, say that because the researchers say, look, there are short-term costs and short-term rewards and then there are long-term costs and rewards. So let's pretend, so I've been married to my wife for 12 years and uh, I'm very happily married. Let's say for a week, she was a very costly person to be around, a miserable person to be around. She was picking fights and you know, uh, saying critical things. I am not going to move out because even if that week, my relationship is very costly and low rewards because in the long-term scheme of things, it's pretty obvious that the, um, rewards outweigh the costs. And so you, you say, oh no, I'm going to hang around. And here's the other thing. Sometimes you make a, you know, like if you're dating or something and it's really costly, even right from the beginning, you probably should get out. If it's, there's no rewards and really costly, even in the beginning, I would get out. Uh, the other thing is about marriage is that you, you made this commitment, right? And so let's say you're going through a difficult time uh, and, it, and marriage is work. Don't let anybody say marriage shouldn't feel like hard work. Anything worth anything is hard work. You have to work hard in the gym to get in shape. You have to work hard at eating right to have good health. 
You have to work hard at any skill to build it. Anything worth anything takes hard work, and marriage is one of those things. Relationships of all types take work. And um, so people who say, oh, it shouldn't take work. Uh, marriage should just feel normal and natural. Um, that's not the kind of person who's going to last very long in that marriage. So uh, those things are part of it. And when it comes to the, remember people get jobs, we take different jobs because they see an alternative. It's also very strange because in marriage, let's say you're in a costly season of your marriage and things are really stressed out and it's not going so great. And then all of a sudden this new shiny person shows up in your life, this comparison level alternative. It would be pretty unwise to say, well, my current relationship is very costly and low rewards, but this new shiny person, oh, it's all rewards. Well, it's, it's a total illusion to compare and contrast short-term rewards and costs to long-term rewards and costs because at the beginning of almost any friendship, or any romantic relationship, it's almost all rewards because everybody's on their best behavior and you don't, there's really no consequences in terms of, uh, you know, you're not living together yet, you're not sharing bank accounts yet, and so it's easy to maintain high rewards and low costs. So there's just a word of caution. The researchers are not suggesting that you use this in some kind, as some kind of guide for getting in and out of your uh, long-term relationships.